Today's episode is brought to you by Primetime Sports Talk, your top source for all major sports content, including DFS, fantasy advice, and great gambling tips. Be sure to head to primetimesportstalk.com to check out their in-depth analysis, exclusive articles, fascinating interviews, and explore the rest of their amazing podcast family. Again, primetimesportstalk.com, your go-to spot for sports content. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode from the A to the Bay podcast. Obviously, I'm Jordan Watkins. That's Kevin Dana. KD, what's going on? How you doing tonight? Hey, good. How are you doing, Waddy? It's uh, great great to be on another week. Uh, double digits we're hitting, right? Yeah, this is 10. Yeah. Is 10. Uh, we're rolling, man. We're look rolling. at us. Hey, I know pilots that only got six weeks. Exactly, so, right? Watch out. Best part about it is uh, now we're finding time to do it with obviously all the other broadcasts and stuff going on. Uh, but I mean, the biggest thing is obviously shout out all the guests that keep coming and and they have fun and always want to keep checking us out. So, uh, you know, that's been great. And, you know, so before we get started with today's show, Kevin, I know you said there was something that you wanted to clarify. Uh, obviously, we we're talking about Myers Leonard last week on that show. Uh, and you said there was something you wanted to clarify on that. Yeah, so my, my opinion and what I said, like, doesn't change. What I wanted to clarify is there was a comment that I said, like, you know, when I was talking about how people would think that, um, that words don't matter necessarily. And I said it like, you know, in the past, people would say where I kind of removed myself from that. I want to, I, I don't like, I don't want to make myself look better than like I actually am. Because like, I would have told you years ago, now, I would not have – I'm not saying I would have never condoned what Myers Leonard said, but I would have been one of those people who said, not to this situation, but just, like, how people put things like um, – I know this is going to sound whatever. I'm kind of, like, flubbing up my words, but I just want to make sure I get this right. Um, there, there was a crowd that I said in my previous comments that, like, being like, words are just words, yada, yada, yada. I think I was a part of that crowd. Not that I would like use racial slurs at people, or I definitely wouldn't have said, you know, the Jewish slur that he said on, on a, uh, on, you know, while he's playing video games. I'm not saying that I, I would never like condone that, but I would, I would say, you know, I was a guy who grew up watching South Park and Dave Chappelle and Carlos Mencia where like it, you know, it was a little less, politically correct and you know I think that's why Dave Chappelle like stopped his show I think he's talked about it where like people were laughing a little too hard at his jokes um I I didn't see the power of words like I I just don't want to like paint myself to be someone who has always had this view when like you know I'm sure some of my friends like if they were to watch it say man come on you you know you didn't think like you were all on the, you know, you were so anti PC or whatever the, the case may be. I, I just want to like say that I should have included myself in that, even though I knew better, even though like I took a lot of Chicano studies classes for my Spanish major. And I, I know the difference, like why I, I stopped saying the word illegal alien, you know, once I got to college, knowing the difference between illegal alien and documented immigrant. Um, I, I just want to make sure that like, my my view of that has like changed i didn't think words mattered because like i listened to eminem and like you know i i watched a lot of gory movies and stuff and i thought all right well that's just that's just entertainment that's just entertainment um but like i realize now that the words do matter um so like my opinion on what myers leonard did hasn't changed but i just want to make sure that like i give an honest portrayal of like where i was um, and again, I'm not saying that I would have said that or that I would have even condoned what Myers Leonard did. I just want to make sure that I, I get the point across that, like, I wasn't always, like, the way I said it wasn't exactly, like, the way I always felt it. And I felt like I tried to remove myself and try to make myself look better than, like, what my actual thoughts on, like, what words men actually were. Because we've... And, like, honestly, I'm not sure I got the grasp of how, like, words really mattered, shame to say, until we saw what President Trump, former President Trump did. Like, how coronavirus, how calling it, you know, how painting it 
as like a thing against Chinese people has like led to all these hate crimes that we're seeing and has just happened in Atlanta, unfortunately. Yeah. Like that's horrible. Um, I didn't see the I didn't see the correlation before. And so I would have been a part of the crowd that, that would have been like, come on, we're making too big of a deal out of this. Um, I'm, I'm not like happy to say it, but I don't think like I made an honest portrayal of myself when I like kind of removed myself from that crowd because unfortunately, I don't think I like when I was a lot younger, I didn't have that foresight. Uh, and so that's all I, I, I wanted to say on that. And hopefully that makes some sort of sense. I'm, and again, I don't want the headline to be, oh, he's condoning Myers Leonard. I would not, and I never would have. Right. But like, yeah. I'm just saying, like, the power of words, even though I should have learned it in college, and even though I saw it living in, like, an Asian-themed dorm at Okada, great dorm, by the way, um, I, and I, like, actually saw, like, this racist stuff play out, like, and, you know, harmed, like, friends of mine in the dorm. Um, but – it didn't really, unfortunately, didn't hit home to me until a lot, lot later. So that's the point I, I hope I get across. No, I, and I think that's appreciated. And the way I look at it, I, I think anybody would be lying if they said it didn't take them time as well. I mean, I think about, you know, growing up in Atlanta is one of those things, of, you know, unless you can, you know, we, we roast or join each other all the time. Yep. Right. And so it's you better have comebacks ready. Otherwise, you're going to keep getting it and keep getting it. And and it's the same thing, you know, where it's you didn't you didn't realize at the moment where depending on what maybe something you said to somebody, how that could actually impact them. It was just right, look, I'm just trying to win. You know, I'm not trying to be the one that's getting joined by everybody else the rest of the day exactly. or the week or or whatever. But, you know, the older you get, like the more you understand it. And you know, I think even when you look in, in professional sports, so many former players have come out about that too. You know, I was looking at an interview with Gary Payton the other day, who's one of the best trash talkers ever in NBA history. Oh, yeah. And even, you know, to hear him talk about some of the things, you know, maybe he would have done differently now or would have done differently with the things that, uh, you know, some things that he's learned as he's gotten older. Uh, you know, I think that's just part of life. So, you know, you're definitely not alone and definitely not the only one in, in that group. Um, and, you know, with that, you also hit on another point. I think it's really important. Uh, and that's in terms of what's been going on with our, with our Asian community here in the United States. And obviously there was a, such a tragic, uh, I don't even know what to call it, um, just murder spree, if you will, that happened in Atlanta with the three spa, three spa uh, places. And, you know, it's, it's just unfortunate. I was even reading a story earlier today about uh, a lady I think she got attacked in San Francisco but thankfully she was able to attack the guy back and he had to go to the hospital um, but it, I mean it, when you look at it and again I and like you said you, you talk about the, the word like the China virus and, and things of that nature I just sit here and look at why why do you feel the need you as in you know anyone who's just feeling that hate towards the, the targeted community why do you feel like taking it out on these people is going to change anything what, well, what, what are you going to get out of that yeah i mean the, 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 the problem we face is that racism and stupidity go hand in hand uh, yeah. and, and so unfortunately i know this is a sports podcast but sometimes i like to go off the deep end wadi I'm with you. and uh i'm i'm going off the deep end here a little bit it's like Trump gave people a reason to be racist and stupid, or he gave them not a reason, but like a, a like a, an avenue, like a like a pass. Here, here's your racism card, and like here here go carte blanche uh, on on all the and like literally on on uh, he made a TV appearance I think on Fox News like a day before the 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 massacre in Atlanta, and used like the Kung flu and China virus as part of like his messaging, like literally a day before that happened or something like some crazy timeline there. Like it, it's hard to not see the correlation. Like if we had there's, there was, don't get me wrong. There's still going to be racists in America. Like, uh, I mean, that's going to be with us for a long time, but like they felt empowered when we got this guy saying, you know, uh, well, you call it coronavirus, you call it 
uh, you know, some people call it the Kung flu and you hear all these people roar in the background Mm -hmm. and it's like, Jesus Christ, what are we living in here? Uh, You know, we're not getting any better as a society anytime soon, the way I see it. And uh, he opened up the biggest can of worms. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the Asian community is paying a huge price. Yes. And, and just one, one thing I want to say with that, too. Uh, you know, you said he, he made it, allowed them to be racist. Obviously, they were they were racist as it was, but he made it cool to be publicly with it, public with it. Yeah, and and you know that's the issue that we have right now, um, and you know it just is with everything else that we have to do. Every everybody, I don't care if you are Asian, not Asian, you know, we we got to all be up against this. Every single person in any any and every way possible is the same. You know, similar thing with what I told a lot of people with Black Lives Matter. It's you know you you got to find we just got to find a way to make do something. You know, even if you think it might be little compared to what someone else is doing, I don't care because everything matters at this point and everything matters to help fight this and combat it. Because, um, right, I mean, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. I think in the last few months, the amount of hate crimes against a- the Asian community here in the, in the United States has gone up over 150%. Yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely so insane. Ridiculous. Yeah, it's yeah. absolutely insane. Um, and you, I mean, even the, if you want to translate it in sports, you know, obviously Jeremy Lin, he was just talking about something he had to go through a few, uh, about a month ago. I saw a young way Koo, who's a kicker for the Falcons. He's been speaking up about it. I mean, it's, you know, but, and the thing is, it's gotta be everybody. Um, even when I think back to the black lives matter, when I think back to black lives matter and when it was at its peak during this pandemic, you know, so many people in the sports world, they were ready to ask the, the black athletes, and what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? You know what they think. <laughs> like, it, in my opinion, it's not important what they think. Ask the, the white athletes. Ask the, um, you know, anybody else from different descents or nationalities. Ask them what they think. Because since it was happening to us as black people, of course, you know what we think. We're going to be angry. We're going to want to make change happen and do things like that. That's a natural to given. Ask somebody else what they think because they're the ones that are really going to help make change happen. Yeah, 100%. And I want to follow up on one point you made about the rise of uh, hate crimes against Asian people in, in the Bay Area. Like, think about that. Like, the Bay Area is generally considered to be a pretty accepting place. Yes compared to other places now there's always going to be pockets of racism in the bay area yada 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 like so on but like if hate crimes are up 150 percent in the bay area just imagine what that number is like elsewhere in in the country that doesn't necessarily is is exposed to um or exposing but like has the experience with um is is around as many asian people as uh, as people in the bay area are i guess is how i'm trying to say it like you know we got a very strong uh asian culture here chinatown in san francisco like a lot of people i i went to within high school in the south bay there's like you know vietnamese is written on like our our recycling stuff because like there is a strong vietnamese population here so like we have a lot of experience and and we know that you know we know a lot of asian people in our lives so if that if the hate crimes are raising in in this area, just imagine where it's like when you only when uh, you know mostly white people only see a handful uh, of Asian people in their daily lives. Just uh, imagine what you know th- those numbers could be. Absolutely, and and as Kevin mentioned before, we we never come into a show wanting to have to do this, but obviously when things like this happen or a situation like what happened in Atlanta takes place, I feel like we as allies and and friends and you know people that we might consider family even to an extent we have no choice but to bring this up and 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 talk about it and so that's exactly what we're going to do you know some people might like it some people might not and if you don't you know it is what it is um but i know i'm going to keep bringing things up if i feel like there's a need to yeah yeah and i hope no one got it twisted when i said exposed i didn't i was trying to figure out a way to say like I could I couldn't figure out the way that I I hope the word exposed didn't like get people like uh, sure. off kilter there. I was just trying to say like exposed sounds weird, I guess. But what I meant like being around, you know, having uh, 
a chance to have, you know, the pleasure of having experiences with yeah, and inter- interactions. Interactions. There yeah. you go. That's the word I was looking for. <laughs> Christ. Would have been nice. Would have saved me two minutes of sounding like an idiot. <laughs> it happens to the best of us. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what we're going to do now, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we have a pretty, this is a fun guest we have coming on today. So yes. you all might remember a few years back, he made a, his long-awaited NBA debut with the LA Lakers. Andre Ingram's going to come on with us and talk about his basketball career and also his transition to what he's doing now in broadcasting. We'll be right back. All right, everyone, welcome back to From the A to the Bay podcast. Jordan Watkins alongside Kevin Dana and our guest today, Andre Ingram from South Bay Lakers, L.A. Lakers, now doing his thing, calling some games with KD in the G League. Andre, how are you doing today? I'm doing excellent, man. Good to see you guys and good to see my broadcast partner again. Yes, sir. Thanks so much for coming on, Andre. Great to be chatting with you again. Yes, yeah, sir. Yes, it is. Yeah, so I got to – I tuned in for a good bit of that game, and I must say it was pretty cool listening to you guys uh, come together. It sounded like y'all have really good chemistry. Was that the first time y'all called a game together, or – um, So the game that you listened to, Wadi, I think was our third – we did three games together. I'm pretty okay. sure you listened to the third one. Um, I, I couldn't – I couldn't – that might have been the Lakeland Raptors game. I can't. I can't remember. I think that was the one you tuned into. But yeah, I think that was our third and final game together. Uh huh. Okay. Cool. And so, I mean, obviously, we'll get into the broadcast side of things a little deeper a little later. But first, starting off again, going back to 2018, you get that call coming up from South Bay Lakers to play the play with the LA Lakers in Staples Center. And it was just so cool to see the reaction around the whole NBA community, right? They, everyone knew the story, showing you love. I saw, you know, so the players, Chris Paul was showing love on the floor. How mm-hmm. was that? Was it like a, just a blur of a moment? What, what was that night like for you? Yeah, the, the night wasn't so much a blur. The whole week was, though. Um, that night, I mean, to be honest with you, the feeling is like I just did not want to wake up, to be honest with you. like... I've had dreams where I'm in the NBA, I'm killing it, I'm destroying it, and then I wake up, man. It's a dream, you know? Like, you you get to the end of the dream, you start feeling like you're about to wake up, and it's like, man. And that whole night, it went, like, so perfect that I was just like, man, do not wake up. Like, this is really happening. Um, it was that cool, man. Like I said, everybody's showing love. I had no idea that as many people knew the story as they did. I'm not on social media, man. So my, my brother had to let me know just how far this story was reaching. I'm in the East Coast. The game didn't come on to 1030 back here. So I'm like, you know, I don't know if my hometown knows what's going on or not, but turns out everybody did. Like, I just didn't know the reach that that moment had for so many people. Um, but looking back on it, that night specifically was just dreamlike and really not wanting to wake up. The week and the days that followed that, that was a blur. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Andre, when you made it from uh, the G League to the NBA, getting that call up with the L.A. Lakers, like it felt, you know, for people who have been in the G League for a while, and I, I may have said this to you before, but like it felt like we all got called up in a sense. Yeah. And like, no, like I, I couldn't have been happier for, for a G League player. Like, you know, outside anyone outside of Santa Cruz I couldn't have gotten that happy yeah. for him like, <laughs> it, it was Andre Ingram um they they showed the video and they did this with Scott Machado and I think they did this with some of their other call-ups where like they would present it as oh we're, we're doing an exit interview but hey we're really calling this guy up to the LA Lakers I mean yeah. when they brought you into that room did you really not know what was about to happen I knew something was up when we did it where we did it now the GM had texted me the night before casually. He was like, you know, we're doing your exit interview tomorrow. Don't be surprised if you see some cameras. We are uh, filming some things for the website, trying to get it up and running, doing some social media things. So that part, think nothing of it at the time. And then as you, you know, as we got there, I've done a million exit interviews. So uh, I get there and we're in the, like the big, you know, like conference room and conference table. And it's not just me and the GM and me and the head coach. It's like a big table with like a bunch more seats. And then the cameras are still here. And, and then, I mean, like, you know, as I'm piecing things together, like, you know, Magic and Rob Palenka walk in. Then it's like, all right, you guys, you, you know, you got it, you know. But it was so cool, man. Yeah, I mean, so they tried to text me beforehand to, 
um, not be worried about the cameras and whatnot. It's just for some internet things they're doing and turned out to be a whole lot more than that. So let's go into the game itself. And so I, I play a good bit of 2K. And so, you know, I know all about that. That green light comes on, right? That perfect release. Yeah. And, and Kevin and I, we always talk about this uh, too, where there's a difference between someone being a bucket and someone being a problem. And you, know, you look throughout your career, right? I think you were you ended up fifth all time in American history in terms of points scored. You know, always a, bit, a good time, a good time scorer with South South Bay Lakers. But then you come to the the LA and the Staples Center, and everything just green light, green light relief, <laughs> and it's just going. I mean, what, what what was your mindset going into that? Was it just you know let it lose, have fun? Were you nervous or tight? Like how, how was that? It's funny you say that uh, right before I was getting ready to check in or right before Luke Walden or Coach Walden called me to go into the game, you know, Kyle Kuzma, he was injured and he was sitting next to me and he was like, you nervous? I'm like, you know what? I think I'm good. You know, I was, I was at that point, I was settled. Uh, I was probably had the most nervous energy the night before. Definitely couldn't sleep. Um, but then when I got to the game and the warmups and the crowd and everything just felt natural, felt right. And, kind of felt like everything that, you know, I'd done the last 10 years was for this moment. And it was so much calm and peace there before going into the game. And so I wasn't really worried about, you know, was the first shot going to go in? I was, you know, genuinely interested in being a part of the NBA and being in the game and running up and down the court and running off some screens and talking on defense and playing basketball, not the show. I was trying to play basketball. So I was fine. I, I wasn't, you know, too nervous at all. And then, of course, the first shot goes and the second shot goes. And then it's like one of those games you've had in the G League where, okay, this, 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 you know, this could be a good one. And then it just, you know, for that to be that night and that debut made it to the unteeth, you know, more special. Um, but I, I did feel calm. I felt electricity from the pregame warmups in the crowd, obviously knowing who I was. And then when the ball went up and it became basketball again, it was just basketball, and I was, I was fine. Yeah, th this might sound like a, a, a weird question for, for people who, who don't necessarily know the G League, but I, I'm curious because if a guy gets called up, you know, sometimes it's not from the, the G League club to the NBA club. So, you know, they put you – you know, if you're coming from a different organization, they're putting you, you know, in a nice hotel or something for 10 days if you're on a 10-day contract or whatever. But you're already with the South Bay Lakers. You're right there. You, you're working in their practice facility, and, and they have a pretty nice apartment set up. I was – I'm – I know this sounds like a weird question, but did your, like, digs change for those you know, week, or did, were you were you just staying in the same spot that you were with with South Bay? It's an excellent question. Uh, no, my digs did not change. I was in the same spot, um, and, you know, our season had ended, like, three days prior to all of this happening. So I hadn't done anything in three days, but you're right. Being there and it being South Bay and I'm, you know, where we stay at is like walking distance to the facility. Absolutely nothing changed in terms of living, transportation, anything. That part was, you know, like flawless, seamless. Then it helped that, you know, same organization, same play, same system, all that helped too. Um, so yeah, my digs didn't change. I wish they did, you know, the experience it for a little bit. <laughs> uh, no, it, it was cool, man. It made the transition easier. Um, so that helped. What did not help is, uh, you know, having not done anything the three days prior to all of this happening and we playing, you know, James Harden and Houston, which was the number one team in the league at that time, you know, the next day. So immediately after, you know, I talked to Magic and Rob and hug all the coaches I went downstairs to the gym. The gym is connected to that part. So the conferences is upstairs. The gym is downstairs. I had to go downstairs and, like, get some shots up just to get the feel for the ball again. I hadn't touched it. You know how it is, man. For guys, guys away from it for two days, you feel like you've, like, lost something. That was three, four full days had not touched the ball. So I had to go down and shoot, man. <laughs> Here, here's a cool part about it, too, for me. So, you know, when we talk about Staples, Staples Center, I think about, you know, Shaq. Lake yep. Bryant, obviously yep. LeBron there now. And, you know, this is a list of people I know that have gotten MVP chance in Staples Center. You're <laughs> on that list. You know, yeah. you're on that list. How, how did that feel? Man, I lied to you not. Like, the genuine only thought I had was, you better make this free throw. <laughs> 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 it was cool to hear the MVP. You know, obviously it was cool, man. And, you know, Staples got a special place in, you know, my heart anyway um 
obviously big Kobe, huge Kobe guy growing up and uh, got to, you know, I was with the LA defenders. They were the LA defenders for the South Bay Lakers. So I was seeing Kobe, you know, when we were sharing the Toyota center as our practice facility. And that was actually not my first game in Staples. Kevin to tell you back then the LA defenders used to play yep. their home games in Staples. One of the best trips in the, you know, D league G league at the time for me was playing the defenders because you got to play in Staples. Mm -hmm. And so I know that or knew that feeling of playing in, man, it's the arena that Kobe played in Shaq, but you know, like he was saying, uh, so the MVP chance started coming. And then that's when, you know, it's like, all right, I'm, I'm, about, I'm about to wake up in a little bit. Like I just am, you know, it is not, you can't be real. And uh, yeah, just make the free throws. That's all I was thinking, man. Yeah. It was tunnel vision once the game started. <laughs> yeah, ju just just a, a little background for, for our viewers or listeners who aren't as a G League, uh, who, who haven't followed the G League uh, religiously like Andre and I have yeah. for the last few years. But, like, correct me if I'm wrong, Andre, but like those those were double headers at Staples, right? Like you like the G League game would be at three and the NBA game would be at seven thirty. That's exactly right. And actually, in reverse, sometimes, because really? sometimes we play the defenders on the weekend, and sometimes on Sundays, the Lakers would play the early game. We would play after them. So, yeah, that's exactly okay. right. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that, that's interesting. And, and another thing, so you played for the Utah Flash, mm -hmm. who then, when they went defunct, you your rights got picked up by L.A., or, yeah, yeah. the defenders at the time. So that's – a. So you you were used to playing as a road you know, as a road player or whatever, and then like when they they took off a year the defenders, then they remodeled or rebranded and uh, then used the practice facility. Um, yeah. yeah, what was uh, what was kind of that like that you know playing for a team that that we've seen this in a few you know a few times recently with teams moving in the G League playing for a team you know for four years I want to say and then and then they go defunct. Yeah, I was with the Utah Flash for his entire existence. So when I started, when I was a rookie in the G League, they were an expansion team. And then they were for, there for four years, went defunct, and that was it. So, like, I have fond memories of, you know, my Utah Flash days. Um, you know, all of those guys I played with there, you know, we're brothers, man. So that entire roster, anybody who ever played for the Utah Flash was my teammate, you know. And I still talk to many of those guys maybe one or two of them still playing. Um, but yeah, that was something to leave that team, you know, cause when it went defunct, I didn't immediately go to the defenders. My rights were there. And uh, coach Musselman was the coach that, that next year, that next season. And he had been calling me um, to come play. And I'm just like, man, coach, I don't know. I, you know, flash went defunct. I really loved the flash. Um, and at this point, my first daughter is about to be born. I was actually working in Utah as a mentor at a uh, as a residential treatment center in Utah. I was working for the first like five or four and a half months of that D League season, and I wasn't playing with the defenders and uh, just missing the flash, man. I, I missed it and um, just wasn't sure if I wanted to go to the new organization and start over again with new teammates, stuff like that, and. Eventually, I joined those guys at the end of that season, and it turned out to be an awesome move. And that organization was just as top notch, if not more so, than the Utah Flashes was. So, so just a quick follow up uh, be before Jordan gets in here: mm -hmm. Were you thinking about retiring from basketball at that point um, when the so, Flash went to flung? Yeah, not retiring, but definitely taking that entire season off. It was, I mean, that was like life changing, not the flash going defunct, but my first daughter about to be born. Like, so, you know, that was my only thought. And my wife wanted to finish her degree in school. And so um, that first, you know, four and a half months of the, you know, G League season, I had no thoughts about playing basketball. It was all, hey, my wife's got to finish school. She's doing her classes in the morning, doing her internship in the morning. I'm with my daughter, my newly born daughter for the, you know, mornings. And in the evenings, that's when I'm working. So we're switching, you know, watching the baby and working and stuff like that. And I was just fine with that. As long as the baby was fine, as long as he was healthy, it was our first child, you know. So I wouldn't, that's what I wouldn't have thought. And uh, then once my wife finished school, once she graduated and the season was still going on, she graduated about like late February, something like that. She had completed her school and the season went on until 
you know, goes on into April or so. Then I started, you know, watching some games again. And every time I've been away from the game, all I had to do is start watching again and something came back. I was like, oh, man, I would have took that shot. Oh, man, I think we should have called this play. Oh, man, you know, and then I'm like, all right, yep, yeah, it's time to go back, you know. Oh, listen, I get it. I mean, I do that. I, I haven't played basketball legit since, what, high school? So, I, and I do the same thing when something's on the post, you know. But yeah. um, one thing I, I want to know that that's that would be fun. So, because I think uh, the Utah Flash, they played in Utah Valley, I believe, right? Yeah. So yeah. walk me through this transition. You're you're in Utah, and then you know the next place where you're playing is you know you're in this LA area. So completely different lifestyle. Like, walk me through that. How was that change? Yeah, that's a good question. Shoot, it, it went before that. I went to college in DC, and uh, you know DC to Utah was quite the difference as well. What I will say about Utah is they love basketball. Um, but I, I, I even met my wife in Utah. So and she's from Arizona. My wife is full blood Native American. She's from the Indian Reservation in Arizona, but was going to school in Utah. So I met my wife out there. The people, uh, you know about the religion. The people are just extraordinarily nice. Um, they love, love basketball. And it is a different culture. It's just different. Um, but every place has a place where you can let loose and our guys would find that <laughs> so I mean there were still you know places you could you know let loose a bit um I wasn't you know kind of that type anyway I never went you know and did too much in the first place so it wasn't too bad of a change for me but going from DC to Utah Utah to LA yeah that's just different <laughs> in every way shape and form it's just different let's just say guys and uh Guys were thrilled that our rights got moved to LA. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you you are the all time leader in the G League in three pointers made, games played. Yeah. I'm curious, is there a game or two that sticks out for just being kind of in, in your G League career that, like, man, this was the the favorite, my favorite game I've ever played in? Whether you know, or just something that really sticks out to you from a game that. Uh, really kind of stays with your memory. Yeah, I can tell you, if it's like a game, um, at Sioux Falls, my first year playing with, I believe it was my first year with the South Bay Lakers. It was after okay. the Defenders Championship, Kevin. So uh, after we okay. played Sioux Falls in the championship. Yep. So you remember, I mean, we had a crazy run to get to the, you know, final and uh, we lose game one at home, our only home game, but win game two in Sioux Falls. And we got a game three for all the marbles, and we got blown out by, by 30, 40 maybe. Well, you had like seven players. Yeah, like seven players. <laughs> you, know, you, know, yeah. you know, like it was one of the worst games of my career. Uh, well, I mean, shooting-wise. And at that time, game three, you know, you, you, want, you, you drop a dud on that game. That hurts. I played all 48 minutes that game, so I felt all of it. <laughs> so, you know, at one point, you're like, man, get me out of this thing. I, coach left me in the whole time, couldn't hit a shot, just one of the low points of my career, that game, you know. And I didn't let it show on the outside, but it definitely tore me up on the inside. So that game left a horrible taste in my mouth. That summer is when my – or that next season – um, is when I went to Australia and that didn't work out at all. Stayed for 10 days and just couldn't handle it. Just probably too used to the G League and D League at that point and uh, trying something new for the first time going overseas just wasn't the move. And I ended up back in the G League and this was the first year they became South Bay Lakers. And one of the first, maybe, maybe one of the first three or so games, maybe it was the third game we played, was at Sioux Falls again. And I had a heck of a game uh, and it felt so good. It really did to like, you know, cause that was about a year's worth of just pain, you know, from that finals to what came to start of next season with Australia and then having to wait all season to get back with the team. Um, cause South Bay couldn't take me immediately. I had to wait until the end of that season to rejoin them. Their roster was full. And uh, so when I got back, and it was like the third game of that season. Just I don't know how many threes it was, but it was it was a lot. It was against Sioux Falls, and that felt great. That was one of my favorite games. Just the redemption feeling. Yeah, That's awesome. no better feeling than redemption. Yeah, um, man, it was something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so here's a question, and it could be you know basketball specific or just 
you know, any aspect of life. Uh, yeah. What would be one big thing that you would want kids growing up to get from your career and your story? Yeah, I always tell people, man, like, they always ask, like, what advice would you give, like, path that people should follow? I, I always tell people just my my specific path was mine. Like, this, this was the way I was supposed to go. Um, I wouldn't recommend it logically to do it the way I did. Like, my young mind only thought, hey, I know you want to make the NBA, and the only way I can do this, my young mind was thinking, it's got to be G League to the NBA. That's the only way it happens. Come to find out that's not true. I mean, you can go overseas, make some money. Teams could would even pull you from overseas. There was a stint, a good little stint, where NBA guys or NBA teams were pulling guys from that were doing well overseas, like often, even more so than the G League for a little bit. And um, and I just never saw that it could be that way. I always thought, hey, to get to the NBA, I have to stay in this league as long as I can to make it up. Um, and I will say, part of my decision to keep coming back to the league every time. And to keep turning down overseas offers, which I did year after year after year after year, was very much preyed on, thought on, you know, like it was very much, it was more than just, hey, I'm going to go or hey, I'm not going to go. It was a thought out decision. It was a preyed on decision. So what I would suggest and definitely recommend for any player for your certain path, however you find direction, I know how I find mine, it's right here however you find direction you have to go with that <laughs> you, you and that's just your path it doesn't make sense to everybody I can't tell you how many people in my career from year one to year 12 in G League now you know telling me hey Dre you really should go see you could make a lot of money you could have a lot of good career you could still make the NBA all this and that and they weren't telling me wrong it just wasn't mine <laughs> you know um and that's obviously a bigger level answer than you know just Hey, we we'll just do this because it's the smart thing. I, I, I don't, I can't tell somebody to go with the smart thing, the logical thing. You have to go with your direction. That is bigger to me than what makes sense, you know. And so that's the only sense you can make out of my career is that it doesn't make sense, you know. So uh, <laughs> that's what I would tell people for sure, man. Yeah, that that's some great advice, and and I want to follow up on, on that point you made versus you know, overseas versus G League, and obviously my perspective is going to be super tainted because I've worked in the G League for nine years. Yeah, but um, you, you mentioned that the Australia, you know, ten days in Australia didn't really work out for you. Was yeah. it because of the style? I mean, was it a matter of just you know being away from home, or the style of play is so? different now I, I enjoy watching me some nbl for sure I, I've, yeah. I've seen highlights it's a great league yeah. uh but you know the the style of play i think we talked about it during broadcast uh, g league is completely different game it's a lot more free flowing than yeah. uh, some leagues I, i'm not sure how it compares to australia but definitely if you see like some some games in europe like you know game you know first to 75 wins there where there if you go. score 75 points in the g league you're gonna lose by 75 oh, wow, yeah. <laughs> so i i mean what kind of what was that 10 days like what what made you realize that the g league was the path for you yeah you know and um to be honest it, it was a lot of those things so let's start with the style of play like you mentioned you're right uh style of play i had gotten grown accustomed and I love the G League slash NBA style of play, the free flowing, the, you know, the high scoring. I spent four years in college at a mid-major that played exactly like my overseas experience. Take all the shot clock down, shoot at the last shot, take a good shot every time. Like I played that for four years. Um, I, I was too far removed from that to enjoy it again, number one. Yeah. But not even close, Kevin. The bigger point and reason of why Australia failed was what I talked about earlier. So every decision I'd made to come back in the, you know, G League every year ultimately came down to this. Now, that decision to go to Australia came after that Sioux Falls game I was telling you about, that championship. And I was so just upset and angry and frustrated from that game. I said, I'm not coming back to this league. I don't care how long it takes. I'm going to wait for the best overseas offer I can get, and I'm just going to go. And um, Australia happened to be that. It, it was just the next thing. It, it really didn't matter who it was. As long as they gave enough money, I was going to go. And I went excited thinking, yeah, this is where I belong. Now I'm going to make some money. And that Australian contract was the would have been the most money I've ever made in my career. Didn't matter. <laughs> it wasn't – it wasn't – 
I didn't go in the right frame of mind. I didn't go in the right spirit. I didn't go with this. And I saw what happened and uh, led me back to where uh, I was always being led back to. And I said, all right, it's for a reason. I'm going to stick in here. I'm going to stick it out. Um, poor shooting game at the wrong time. Game three, game seven in the NBA Finals or not, I'm going to stick it out. I'm going to hang in there because obviously you're telling me to, and we're just going to see what the end's going to be. So Australia ultimately, in my opinion, didn't work because of that. Now, and then you throw in the other stuff, style of play, definitely. I much prefer the NBA G League style than that style, that college field style that I got from it. Um, because the teammates were great. My coaching staff was great. You know, one of my coaches is Coach Austin Spurs now. You know, like, all of that stuff was fine. The city, the place was beautiful. Perth was beautiful. I mean, the water was right there. The weather was nice. It was, it was beautiful. For all intents and purposes, it should have been perfect. Logically, it should have been perfect. It just wasn't. Um, and some things are bigger than, you know, the circumstances. Man, your spirit ain't right. Your mind ain't right. And that's exactly what Australia was. And I recognized it immediately, told my family, told my best friends about it. Hey, I'm not doing well. I need to come back and uh, give this G League another shot. And that's what ended up happening. All right. Well, let's, let's trans transition then to the broadcast a little bit. Yeah. And just to start off, uh, you know, one, what made you want to get into it? And what was, and then two, what ha has been, what was like the most difficult thing you've experienced so far in making that transition? Maybe something that was harder than you expected. Yeah. You know what? Um, I was, what, what South Bay opted out and um, I didn't end up joining the draft to play in the bubble. And once, you know, the league knew that, they actually came to me about, hey, you, think you want to try broadcasting or give commentating games a shot? I said, absolutely. It's always something I felt like I would enjoy. People ask me all the time, hey, man, you want to coach? You know, you, you'd be a good coach, I think. I, <laughs> I tell Kobe Call this. I tell anybody who will listen. I'm just not in. I, I think you have to want to coach. I see the hours these guys put in. Like, when I got injured this past season, tore my pack for the season, like Kobe call, let me be a part of the coaches meetings. Like these guys are meeting two hours, three hours before practice. They're meeting two, three hours after they are cutting up film. They're doing, you got to want to do that. Like I do not want to be a coach. I don't want to do that. But this, I thought I would enjoy. I thought I would like to do. Everyone commentates when they watching games and think they could do it anyway. Yeah. I'm like, um, I would say it was definitely, an enjoyable experience. And I know that because even when I was messing up, even when I'm cutting Kevin off and talking when he's talking and not doing it right, I was like, dang, I'm messing up, but I'm enjoying this. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's <laughs> you know? So uh, I, I, I thoroughly enjoy broadcasting. I told, you know, everyone who got me connected into this, hey, you got more opportunities, especially if it's G League related, man, please let me know. Cause I, this, I would love to do. Yeah, no, you uh, you are a rising star in this business. I mean, from from the games that I watched, I, I watched your first broadcast. Didn't realize it was like you, so. John Fanta and I, another G League broadcaster, yeah, Fanta. Said, we we text a lot, and he was telling me he's like, dude, Andre Ingram, like it was his first game. You would have <laughs> never noticed it. You would have never. He was he was like just singing your praises. And then, like, I, so I watched the game, and I, I'm, I'm, you know, DM and you know, a guy I know with NBA broadcast, I'm like, we need to, to find a way to keep Andre Ingram broadcasting these games because, I mean, no, it was – yeah, no, I mean, your, your institutional knowledge, number one, then obviously, you know, your, your basketball IQ just makes it for just such an enjoyable listen. I, I really hope you get some more broadcasts for sure. Man, me too. I appreciate that. I, I really do because I, I, I can feel myself messing up and I'm like, dang, but this is so fun, you know? So, yeah, it was – no, I appreciate you guys, man. You And the producers, the play-by-play -play guys, you know, they were, you know, goofing off in your ear, made you laugh, made you comfortable. Like, I was with all of that. I'm like, man, this is for me. This is this is enjoyable. Yeah. <laughs> When, one way you can look at it is you'll never cut Kevin off as much as I probably have. <laughs> so. I need to be cut off more, actually. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean, even just to piggyback off what Kevin said, even with a game that I was watching 
and I, one thing I always tell people, the reason why I get into broadcasting is because I love to share my passion and excitement for sports with other people. Yeah. And I, you know, I always hope that it, it comes off when I call games. And I could, I could sense that when you and Kevin were calling games, just how much fun, like you said, having fun. I could tell how much you love the game and being around it. it. It popped off the screen for me too. And I'm gonna tell you, man, especially with Kevin, someone who knows the G League, because it ain't many people like that, you know, like that made it enjoyable. When I can say names like Ron Howard and Ronaldo Major, Curtis Stenson, and Kevin's like, oh man, yeah. And I'm like, that, that's what I'm talking about, you know, because, you know, I mean, not everyone knows the G League like that, but, you know, those guys are like heroes of mine, you know, Ronaldo Major, Mo Baker, you know, Ron Howard, like those are heroes, you know. People know me now because of the story. People don't know, man. Those guys are like the true G League, you know, like really royalty. So, yeah, man, to have a partner who knew about all that stuff, and we could talk about it, to be honest, at one point, I did not care if any of the viewers knew who we were talking about. I was taking a trip down memory lane with Kevin, and I was enjoying every bit of it. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I didn't care either. Like, I, I, like, there was something in the back of my mind. I could hear some, like, some, like, imaginary producer telling me, what the hell are you doing, Kevin? But it's like, I don't care because I'm enjoying this. And honestly, I know Jordan's a, a much less selfish person than I am. I'm but not, I don't care what other people think. I don't care if my passion, if, if I inspire others, I care because I enjoy doing it. Yeah. And um, I, I know I was having a lot of fun going down memory lane, talking about the best players that, that man, never made cool. the NBA. Um, and, cool, uh, you know, you know, I, 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 I would have loved for Ron Howard to, to get that shot. Um, yeah, you know, I, 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 <laughs> he is the um, answer. I, like he is the answer to that question. Yep. There was no other answer. Yeah. Oh, uh, Mr. Mad Ant himself. Mm -hmm. I, I think the original Mr. Mad Ant was Walker Russell Jr. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then he took it over. I, yeah. the, I heard stories because uh, Cam Cameron Jones used to play for the Fort Wayne Mad Ants and he played in Santa Cruz. That, like he yeah. said, like he would, Walker Russell Jr. was so entrenched in Fort Wayne that when he got called up to the Detroit Pistons, he would come back to hang out in Fort Wayne while he was on the Pistons. Oh, gosh. Um, wow. Yeah. yeah so I, I believe Walker Russell Jr. could play. He oh, just man. Like, Hooper. Yeah. Yeah. He <laughs> Um, I, I know, uh, I know we're kind of running thin on, on time. So I, I, you know, my, uh, my, I guess my parting question to you, we do a coast to coast and then, you know, I, I Wadi can follow up with, with whatever he wants, but, uh, yeah. we usually have like a, a top five. Um, okay. and si since I, I feel like I'm speaking, you know, with, with, the with the man with all the answers, I kind of want to get two top threes from you. Okay. Um, to, to split the difference. Like that. Yeah, so um, and we call this section coast to coast. Uh, right. You know, since uh, Wadi's from Atlanta, I'm I'm from San Jose, and, and we got Richmond, Virginia, in the house today. Oh, nice! Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so, uh, your three favorite hotels or G League cities to visit, and then your three players who in the G League who got a cup of coffee, but you thought deserved more of an NBA career. All right, so let's start with the places to stay. <laughs> Man, I'm going to go way back. What, not, what should I start with number three or number uh, – okay. Uh, yeah, however you want to do it. I'll do any order because this is – this was by far my favorite trip, G League, period. And this is actually D League. But uh, when the Anaheim Arsenal were here – Okay. I would go – I would go to Disney. I'd walk to Disneyland. I would walk to Disneyland when we used to play the Anaheim Arsenal. I used to love it. So Anaheim was like right, like I could walk 10 minutes. I'd be in downtown Disney. Really? Hmm. Used to walk there from the hotel. Man. Yeah. Um, number two was obviously when I was with the Flash, Staples, State, so LA Defenders. Uh, third, and this is not, this is not to, uh, to win any points with you, Kevin, but Santa Cruz, man. Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz. Okay, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> Hotel Paradox is is extremely nice, but um, it's the uh, hibachi place that's down the street on uh, okay. where we stay from on Water Street. I think it's called Saki. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. nice. Yeah, 
uh, whenever we go to Santa Cruz, I call my wife, say, "Baby, we going to Hibachi spot. I'm a videotape it, send it to you. It's like a tradition. You go there, we're going to Saki, I think it's called, up on Water <laughs> Street, I think, maybe. So, okay, yeah. yeah. I, I don't – do you, do you know our, our GM, Ryan Atkinson, at all? Maybe not by name, but if I saw him, I probably would. Okay, because he's a huge Hibachi guy. Like Anywhere yeah, we yeah. would go to um, – Quickly, my, my three, not that anyone asked for it, but I feel compelled to, to give my top three. Um, Bakersfield, that hotel, the Marriott, you guys didn't get a chance to stay there probably yeah. because you guys would drive there, but they put us up at the Marriott. Uh, two fat sandwiches, a, bl- a block away, best chocolate chip cookies. Uh, big fan of that. Uh, I, I, loved, uh, I loved Oklahoma City slash Tulsa. Tulsa, they put us up at the Hard Rock Casino. Awesome. Uh, could no, watch some of our go, man. I remember yeah. talking. And, and then Oklahoma City put us in the Sheridan. That that place really? was really nice. And then uh, I was I was a big fan of Reno. I I love Reno. <laughs> uh, I know a lot of people don't like Harris. You 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 walk through a cigarette. Uh, you know, scent of uh, you know, on, on your way to the basketball court. You're the walking whole through the way. The yeah. whole. <laughs> but um yeah so it, that that'd be my top three with an honorable mention to portland maine you ever get a chance to go to maine i've not been to portland maine we've never oh. played the main red cross at maine while i've been on the defenders or the flash okay yeah no very very nice city um so yeah that that'd be my top three and then uh your your players so wait, what was the, the player's question so like uh who is a guy who you thought through playing in the g league yeah. Uh, should have gotten more of an NBA look. We talked about players who never made it. This is for, like for guys who, who were there in the NBA but didn't stick for some reason. Yeah, so I'll tell you, this guy, first guy I'll name, he was a teammate, but not saying it because he was a teammate. I'm saying it because after my first season in the G League, my brother asked me, he was like, was it anybody you played against that just you felt like was just on a different level than everybody else? I said, yeah, it was two guys. One was Ramon Sessions. He had his, you know, a lot of time in the yeah. NBA. Yeah, the yeah. other guy, though, ended up being a teammate of mine. He played for Dakota my first year, Dontel Jefferson. He oh, was, yeah. Dontel was amazing. Six five. When I first saw him, I said, is this dude a one or two or three? He, he can do everything. He can shoot. He's supremely athletic. Um, like, this dude is the truth. <laughs> like, then I played with him when he came to Utah Flash. Obviously, he earned a call up to the Charlotte Bobcats. I thought he would stick because he had the size at point. And he was super athletic, just super athletic. Uh, could play D. So, yeah, Dante Jefferson, uh, I'll say that. Other guys I'm surprised didn't stick. Um, let me think. Uh, what was a good one? Try to go away from teammates here. <laughs> uh, uh, I know, yeah, my teammates, I think all of them. Uh, let's see. Oh, man, you mentioned Reno. Vince Hunter. Oh, yeah. Vince Hunter. Killer. Man. <laughs> Vince Hunter, like, would, I mean, at six, what, six, 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 seven, if, if that was yeah. just a terrorizer in the G League, man. At yeah. Dunking everything, just stronger than everybody. Uh, he was an absolute monster, man. Absolute beast. Um, so, yeah, him. And uh, the last one. Vince Hunter, Don Tell. I'm thinking point guards here. Going point okay. guards here. Uh, 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 I'm thinking of point guards. I could always go with my favorite teammate, um, Turkey, right now, Josh Majek. Always go uh, Josh. Oh, yeah. yeah, man. yeah he, he, always go Josh. Uh, yeah, man. I mean, yeah, I probably have gotten more points from his assist than anyone. So, <laughs> yeah, man. But uh, Majet, obviously, I just think as I watch him grow, as I watch him play, especially in today's game, like to come off the pick and roll and always make the right decision. Always seem like, you know, it's like a, always a high percentage play with him. He's going left. He can go all the way to the rim. He'll either find somebody or he can finish. If he's going right, he'll stop with that step back dribble and pull up for the three. But every time he comes off of a pick and roll, it just seems like he makes the right decision. 
and whatever team he's playing for, they get a good possession out of that play. You know, like, and for as much as we run that type of offense now, G League, NBA, yeah. um, I, I don't think there is a team that could not use his, you know, IQ, his toughness. Obviously, you guys know how tough he is, the way he plays. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a solid three for me. Yeah. Definitely. Hey, yeah. The number of losses he handed the Santa Cruz Warriors <laughs> more than I'd like to count. Yeah, um, he's, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's tough, man. And because I need to indulge myself, my three, because I want to hear your opinion on these guys. Yeah. Um, Otheus Jeffers, I love. <laughs> Big Otheus Jeffers fan. We talk um, about Vince Hunter at 6'7". Otheus Jeffers at 6'5". Yeah. Even more dominant even more yeah. yeah i mean i remember him one time because he must have had like a seven two wingspan or something had to like, his claws big as Kawhi. yes exactly just calm casually drove baseline and dunked on like a six ten big just like where he was kind of sideways to the hoop and it just looked so easy to him. yeah um and then you know a couple of santa cruz guys elliot williams and joe alexander i thought they were by far and above oh, yeah. better than the g league for sure. Okay, yeah. Yeah, Ellie Williams for sure. Yeah, yeah. Ellie yeah. for sure, man. And I remember Joe – I didn't play against Joe too often, but, yeah, man, his athleticism off the charts. He started with Milwaukee, didn't he? Yeah, he was the number eight pick, and then uh, he, he, he came there injured, uh, and they had him, like, rehab in Vancouver. He only played, like, 47 games for them, and they – he had good per 36 numbers, but they moved on from him, and he, he yeah. just was injured, and – Never got a chance to to get back there after you know playing with Chicago and, and training camp with New Orleans. Um, yeah. But man, at, like the two years he was with Santa Cruz, I mean, just yeah. he shouldn't <laughs> have been there. I tell you what, y'all have some tough teams. Always do. Man, oh, those, those are some good battles. Uh, I'm looking forward yeah. to getting the South Bay Lakers back in the G League for next season. Yeah, I can't wait, man. I can't wait. I'm trying to think what would be my three. I'm going to use a cheat code on, or a cheat for one of these cities. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. they're new. And so I actually went to school like right across the street, basically from where they played. Uh, College Park Skyhawks. Will be, oh, okay. Will be, I get to, to be out there. Yeah. to be there. Yeah. yeah. So I went, I went to high school right, right across the street in College Park. So yeah. that, that's my cheat. That's going to be my cheat. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, let me think. What else? And I know there's, there's a, uh, I think Birmingham's getting a team soon. They are. Um, they so are. that'll be another one. I've been to Birmingham a few times, obviously not too far of a drive from Atlanta. Nice. And and then uh, Capital City Go-Go. It's a D.C. D.C. Oh, yeah. So DC. Neither one of I have I been to yet because South Bay doesn't, all, doesn't always play all the, you know, teams on the East Coast. So we hadn't played, you know, Capital City or uh, or uh, College Park. Okay. That, yeah. that, that is a really nice facility. They're like trying to build a neighborhood around where the Go Go and like mm -hmm. Wizards practice facility is. And so, like nice. when I went there with Golden State on a trip like a couple of years ago when they played the Wizards, like I got a chance to see the Go Go facility and, it, and like it, it was still like under construction, the neighboring mm -hmm. area. But like yeah. once that gets built out, I mean, like that the practice facility itself is super nice. So nice. Uh, yeah, that that is that is a nice place. Yeah. Cool, man. Yeah, I can't wait to visit. I, my, hopefully, when the schedule comes, I wouldn't know where we're going. But, yeah, we don't touch all the East Coast teams for some reason. Yeah. 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 Three players. Josh yeah, your players. Because uh, he used to be in the summer league with the Hawks for a good bit. Yeah, yeah. He had he had two-way with them. Yeah, yep. that's right. That's yeah, right. He had two-way when, uh, when Buttonhoser was there. Yeah, yep. that's right. Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, he would have been one. Uh, actually, another one. This is more so because we were at Stanford at the same time as one of your teammates. I always want to see Marcus Allen get a chance. Marcus Allen, yeah. my man. <laughs> hey, yeah, he texted me after one of the broadcasting games. He was like, he man, I knew that voice. Marcus is my guy, man. I've played with him the last what three years now? Two years now? Yeah. yeah. So love, love Marcus Allen. There is very few people more beloved in the South Bay community than Marcus Allen. Trust me. That's a good one, man. Overall, good dude. Like, plays hard, you know. Like, I mean, even when he was at Stanford, it was a blur and just on defense, he'd be a pest. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then if, if he gets in the air, just get out the way. Yeah. Dang, yeah. that's a good one. I would tell him you said that. That's a good one. <laughs> Great <laughs> rim finisher, man. Oh, I yeah. used to uh, – sorry, I didn't mean to cut you oh, off, you're Jordan. You're good. Um, just to share, since we're talking Marcus Allen, I used to work Stanford basketball camps. Yeah, uh, he and Malcolm used to come 
and like when they were like 10 years old because their oh. mother was a gymnast who went to Stanford so like they lived in Las Vegas but they were coming to the Stanford basketball camps yep. and they both had like these big big goggles that they would wear <laughs> um and I I I think they both had flat tops back then um but like yeah like just 10 years old like these big old goggles and like we we, we knew oh these, these were the Allen twins because they would come every year and it was like awesome to see them both play for Stanford as well athletes athletes man athletic family yeah yeah then my uh my last one so he's he's with the Hawks now but still oh. early I want to see him keep giving chance getting chances but uh Nathan Knight uh because every single chance the Hawks give him he puts up some good as well and gives him good uh you know good productive minutes so I'm hoping he keeps to get to stay around and, and keep producing with them is he two-way right now so I think right now he might be uh, right. but I think College Park actually they're not in the bubble, so they they didn't do the bubble, so he's just been up with them the whole time. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. I'm double checking this, but I'm pretty sure he is on it. Yeah, he's on two way. You're right. Yeah. Well, yeah. He he was really good against the Houston Rockets, uh, because I, I watched that last game that they played against Houston. Yeah, no, I I'm a big Nathan Knight fan. Yeah, he had a nice dunk over uh Jared Allen when we played the Cavs a few days ago, too. Okay. Yeah. Dang, okay, yeah. Well, he made a name for himself there, man. <laughs> there you go. I hope all those guys that they stick, man. I know what it's like to, you know, want to stay, you know, so. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, Andre, man, we appreciate you coming on. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. I always have fun with Kev and uh, Jordan. Excellent to meet you, man. So I appreciate you guys. Yeah. Awesome, man. Thanks so much, Andre. Good. Yeah, no problem. Y'all be good. Jordan, you know it is 945 here. I'm about to go straight to the bed, man. East Coast. <laughs> I don't blame you. I don't blame you. Yeah. All right, man. Y'all be good. I appreciate it, guys. And we just had Andre Ingram on. And, you know, that was such a fun interview, Kevin. I mean, all of our interviews are fun. But again, to, to, to hear a story like that, and, and you can even see and, and hear the excitement and appreciation that he has for the game and what his career was like. It, you know, it's always so great to hear and see stories like that. Yeah, you know, whenever I get a chance to broadcast or in this case podcast with Andre Ingram, I feel like, I, I feel like I'm talking, you know, like they ask you, who is someone you'd want to have dinner with or whatever? Like they have that conversation, like historically, who would you want to have? And like, you know, as a G League guy, like, even though LeBron James is my favorite player of all time, I'd much rather eat with a Ron Howard or Mo Baker uh, and just or an Andre Ingram, you know, guys that he was mentioning, and just trade G League stories. So I feel like I got like a million questions that rushed to my head, and it's like I gotta I gotta ask the Oracle while I have the chance to speak with the Oracle. You know, it's like the All Seer Andre Ingram. I, I just get so excited every time we get a chance to talk. Yeah, I mean, I just remember it was so cool to. I was thinking back on, I remember when you first, when I first saw that game where y'all were calling the game together in the uh, G League bubble. And I immediately thought back to when I saw him playing, well, I remember I first saw the video, I think it was on Twitter, when he got the, when he got the call up. And yeah. then, you know, seeing him coming in and playing and, and Chris Paul was talking to him after the game. I, I immediately thought back to that and I thought it was so cool because I've always had an appreciation or a bigger appreciation for players that are, you know, they, they weren't just the, that can't miss talent from, from high school or college or whatever it may be. It was those guys that, you know, once they get their chance, they come in, they're going to give you everything they can possible. Uh, like I remember way back when with the Hawks, when they had Ivan Johnson and, yes. this, and I think he, he was, you know, overseas after that, but Ivan, anytime he was in the game, like, he was just going to cause havoc and and I remember I think we had a TNT game one time, and uh, Ivan's in the game, put, putting up some solid numbers. And they were showing I think it was like Al Horford, uh, there were some other guys on the on the bench. And Charles Barkley was was saying, I see a couple of guys right there. He can get some minutes over. <laughs> it, was, it was just cool. So I, I love guys and stories like those. Those I think those are what make the NBA just even that much more enjoyable, in my opinion. Uh, I, I am with you 100%. I'm looking up – I want to say he played at Oregon for a year collegiately. Yeah, I'm, I think so. Yeah, okay, he did. He did. Um, And, like, 
the profile he had for his two years in the NBA, like, would lead you to believe that he would have played more than two years in the NBA. Because that sure. guy was, like, a, a legit contributor. Uh, there, there were some G League circles uh, that I was in. I remember, like, um, yeah, his name came up in a G League conversation just, like, for, like, like guys you didn't want, like, just so tough to handle. And, like, his, his name – uh, came up, yeah, because he Absolutely. played. He played a few years in, in the G. He actually played for the Anaheim Arsenal since uh, uh, yeah. Andre Ingram mentioned Anaheim. Um, they became the Springfield Armor, who became the Grand Rapids Drive, who are now apparently going to be controlled by the Denver Nuggets. But uh, that is way more information than anyone ever wanted to know about the Anaheim Arsenal. <laughs> uh, yeah, but no, I mean, you talk about the guys you don't want to mess with. I think he's been thrown out of, of a couple of leagues yeah. now overseas for for that exact reason. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so sticking on the topic though of basketball, yeah, um, yeah, March Madness is here, and it's time to celebrate. That's the best part of the year. Katie's got his brackets. I have mine on the iPad. And, and before we start to really dive deep into these, speaking of March Madness, shout out to Future because his song March Madness just went double platinum this week. Oh, wow. So shout out to the ATL and the real one out there, Future. Congrats! Hey, um, I'll tell you, half of us on this podcast are big Future fans. <laughs> this is this is very true very <laughs> true and if you can't guess it's me i'm, I'm the half um, <laughs> actually since you know so, as proportional uh with size wise i'd say it's about a good two-thirds yeah but, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. That, that, that's about right <laughs> but yeah let's, let's dive let's dive into these kev we'll start with the women's side yep and and first and foremost uh, can we get the women some better facilities to work with while That's they're in the bubble, bubble in, in San Antonio, please? That's crazy. Please. Like, I, I I mean, yeah, Allie Kirshner, Stanford sports yep. performance coach, uh, you know, colloquially strength coach. That's kind of what we called them back in the day. Uh, sports performance coach, like, posted, like, the picture of, like, the, uh, you know, the men's setup versus the women's setup. Like, that is just ridiculous. I, and, like, you know, usually, generally, I've been on NCAA tournament trips with Stanford women's basketball before. Uh, by trips, I mean trip. Uh, so just one. But, like, you know, stayed at a good hotel in Chicago. Like, yeah. nothing that would lead me to believe that that would be the situation. Like, I mean, what are, what are they, middle schoolers with that and, setup? And it's crazy because you think about it, obviously, the, the, on the men's side, they've been pretty vocal on Twitter and other social media about their conditions and, you know, what they're getting in terms of the meals and things of that nature. But then it's like, no, let's take, we, we got to take this to a whole nother level because you think that's bad. And I'm not trying to take anything away from their situation, but yeah, women are getting, I mean, that that's ridiculous. Again, these are, they're, they're D one athletes. You want to make these bubbles so you can make as much money off of them as possible, but you can't give them the right, the right facilities to make sure they perform at the highest level. Yeah. Everybody wait in line five minutes to get your turn, uh, your turn on the dumbbells. Uh, that's crazy. Or your sanitized yoga mat. Yeah. Which apparently they didn't have enough of or something. You gotta be kidding me. It's, it's ridiculous. Hey, what else is new? The, the no, NCAA right. is growing up. No, absolutely. Uh, but with that, again, like I said, we want to get into – their the the bracket for the women first uh kd go over what do you have in your for your final four okay well no surprise here i have stanford in the final four okay. um i'm taking south care so stanford's in the alamo region i have stanford yep. beating missouri state in the sweet 16 and louisville as they say in the elite eight i have south carolina beating stephen f austin the 12th seed i have stephen f austin going sweet oh, okay. 16 South Carolina getting to the Elite Eight where they will defeat UCLA. Now, yeah. Maryland's a really good team, but uh, you know, there's something about teams like, you know, in March, you usually only go, what, eight deep or whatever. And UCLA's been playing eight deep all season uh, because yeah. they've literally only had eight players at times. Right. Um, and, and Michaela Onyenwede is a beast out there. Big Offensive fan of rebound Michaela. machine. Yeah, rebounding machine. Charisma Osborne can create her own offense. And Natalie Cho, one of my favorite players to watch shoot in, uh, in women's college basketball this year. So I have them going to the lead eight, but I have South Carolina uh, getting there. On the other side, I have uh, UConn getting past Kentucky in the Sweet 16, where they will go up against Baylor, which beat Tennessee in my bracket in the Sweet 16. And I have Baylor 
getting to the final four. Okay. Hey, everyone loves Paige Beckers, myself included. Same. But I, I think, well, you know, we both have a favorite player on Baylor uh, who, <laughs> yeah. who, who's pretty experienced and quite the basketball player. I think kind of that institutional knowledge can get them over the top. Um, and uh, that would be uh, DJ Carrington's second Final Four. I want to say her freshman year was 2017. That's when Stanford last made it. Uh, so, yeah, a chance to get to the Final Four for D. And Carly then I have NC State. Ankle. I'm sorry, what's that? I was just saying, if Carly didn't hurt that ankle. Oh, they 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 would have they would have they would have beat South Carolina. They wouldn't have won a national championship. They would have won a national championship, absolutely. Oh, don't remind me. All right, uh, NC State over Gonzaga in the Sweet 16. NC State the one seed. Then I have Arizona playing Texas A&M in the Sweet 16. I crossed this out like a couple of different times. Mm-hmm. I eventually went with Texas A&M, okay. uh, but I love Ari McDonald. They have some other like really solid players on that team uh, in Arizona. Kate Reese has had a really nice year for them. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm going to go with Texas A&M. So my final four is Stanford, South Carolina, Baylor, Texas A&M. I have Stanford right. over South Carolina, Baylor over Texas A&M, and in the DGNA Carrington Bowl, I have Stanford uh, taking it uh, all the way, which, of course, I have Stanford taking it all the way. I call their game. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, disclaimer, I'm biased. So, you know, I might be too. Uh, because So I have Stanford. Uh, they actually beat – Arkansas on mine in the Sweet 16, and they beat Georgia. So I had Georgia upset Louisville. Of course you have Georgia in the Elite Eight. Oh, I mean, it's just – I mean, what uh, what they've done this year. Yeah, no, no. Uh, done at Georgia, I, 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 I want to reward them for it. So um, – SEC Coach of the Year, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, probably. So, um, yeah, I, I'm just giving you a hard time. <laughs> so, yeah, I had to go – I had to go Georgia with that one. But, yeah, so um, Stanford goes in the Final Four from, from the Alamo region – uh, so the the hemisphere region, uh, same thing. South Carolina over UCLA, and I even thought about that one for a second. And the, the big thing for me too was when I was listening to what uh, Corey Close was saying after they got blown out by Stanford in the Pac-12 championship, and you know they they felt like it's like no, we should have played them a whole lot better than that. That that didn't sit right with us. Yeah. And so I always had this thing about teams that have a chip on their shoulder going yep. into the champ into the tournament. Um, and so, yeah, I, I was thinking, it's like, oh, they, you know what, they, they might be able to pull off an upset against South Carolina with, with that. You get hot. I mean, who knows? But yeah. in the end, I, I can't go against Don Staley no. in, uh, in South Carolina. I just can't do I will, it. I will say Corey Close is a hell of a coach. Yes, she is. Incredible coach. Big fan of the work she has done. Absolutely. Uh, you know, since, since they won the WNIT like, four or five years ago, whatever, they've just been on a roll. Yeah, they've they've been crushing. I mean, shoot, I mean, remember when they beat Stanford uh, down in Santa Cruz? Yep, yeah, that's uh, the last team year. Stanford lost to. Yeah, and then let's see, Riverwalk. Same thing. I had uh, actually, but the only difference for me was I had Iowa beating uh, Kentucky, and big part of that, uh, Caitlin Clark. I think it's it's weird. You know, you would think as a freshman being named to a second team All American team, you wouldn't have a, a chip on your shoulder to prove something. But when you go against a, a Ryan Howard on that big of a stage, I think she's going to be out there wanting to put on a show. Um, so I had Iowa going with an upset, but then UConn against Baylor. I'm not going against DJ Carrington, at least not yet. So <laughs> they win that one. And then lastly, uh, I actually had Arizona beating Texas A&M and then beating NC State. Okay. So, so two Pac-12 teams in the final four with Stanford, uh, going against South Carolina at, South, at Stanford, winning that one, and then Baylor against Arizona. Uh, Baylor just they're just too deep, in my opinion. Um, mm-hmm. yep. So went with Baylor, and then Stanford seventy two sixty four in the um, in the final. Ooh, I, I didn't pick a score. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm I, I'm gonna yeah yeah. All right, I was gonna say eighty one seventy three, but I think the defenses yeah. are gonna clamp down in a championship game. Some usually championship games, I feel like for the most part, are a little bit lower scoring. Yeah, he's a little lower. Yeah, I remember the 2010 game. Uh, it was like 53 47, something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, at UConn, Stanford, because like Stanford just completely shut down UConn in the first half. Um, yeah, my, my since you brought up Caitlin Clark in Iowa, uh, which I think everyone wants to see Caitlin Clark versus uh, Paige Beckers in the Sweet 16. 
I have Central Michigan actually upsetting Iowa because, like, Central oh. Michigan, there's some institutional, like, success there. They went to the Sweet yeah. 16 a, f- a few years ago as, like, an 11, I want to say. Uh, and, like, my thing is, like, I find mid-majors in the women's game, and I just stick with them. Uh, so, like, you know, Green Bay was dope, like, 10 years ago. So, I'm mm-hmm. like, it, it, anytime the Green Bay Phoenix are, like, hooping, like, uh, I'm, I'm going to side with them. Like, Missouri State got to the Sweet 16 and played Stanford a couple of years ago. That's why I – you know, took Missouri State this year. Uh, yeah, they they have a, obviously their their former coach now the head coach at Tennessee, but like the, their new head coach has done a really good job there, uh, keeping that program rolling. So yeah, just, since you mentioned Iowa, I, I just had to say that I picked Central Michigan in an upset there. Yeah, so I mean, I'm I'm with you in terms of the mid majors. Uh, if Maris was in it, I'd probably pick Maris to win a couple games. Oh right? man, yes. Yeah, yeah, I oh, I I know someone on that Sweet Sixteen team. Oh, oh really? Yeah. Oh, Julianne Viani. Yeah, I broadcast okay. games with her. She mentioned – and, like, she's done some Pac-12 networks, but I, I worked the mm-hmm. showcase with her. She's, like – and, you know, I was doing – either she told me she went, she played at Marist or I did the research. I probably didn't do the research. Uh, she told me she played at Marist. Uh, and uh, I was like, oh, yeah, you were that one t- – the 13 seed that came mm-hmm. to Stanford and, and got to the Sweet 16. Yeah. Oh, man. Great. Great memories. I, I, I Hey, you were like what in middle school when that happened? That that's that's uh, good uh, recall or hi, maybe high school. Was that? I, mean, like I think it was early high school. I want to say early high school. Okay, all right. Yeah, no, that. Hey, I mean that happened right in my backyard. I was I, that was like either my sophomore or junior year at college. Okay. So like I, I like you know that happened right in you know where I work. But yeah, no props for for that memory for you know someone much younger. And sometimes things stick up here. Sometimes. <laughs> um, but yeah, heading over to the men's side. Uh, how, how are we looking there with your final four? All right, West region. Uh, so I got Gonzaga getting past Ohio in the Sweet 16. I'm all about uh, Preston uh, there. Like, I remember watching him. I think it was last year when they were talking about his story. Um, and, you know, like, Ohio's been a pesky 13, 14 seed before. So I'm rocking with okay. them in the Sweet 16. Yeah, so I have Virginia going from losing to the first ever 16 seed to winning the national championship to losing in the first round as a four seed. Um, the, the roller coaster experience. So Gonzaga will meet USC in the Elite Eight. Um, I'm usually wary of Pac-12 teams in the NCAA tournament since, you know, it's been 24 years since they've won it all. Sorry, Bill um, yeah, <laughs> conference of champions. Um, but uh, on the men's side, it hasn't been the case. Uh, but I, I, I just, I mean, Evan Mobley is a beast. Taj Edey, who I watched play at Santa Clara, has been hitting some big time buckets for them. I want to—he had the game winner against UCLA. Um, I want to say in like one of their final regular season games. And I have USC actually beating Oregon. I got Oregon over Iowa. I love watching Iowa, okay. but they, they can't stop anyone sometimes so uh i'm gonna go with the uh, oregon uh in that so usc over oregon and then i got gonzaga over usc that's the west yeah. in the east i got uh michigan playing florida state in the sweet 16 and losing to the fight in leonard hamilton's i got florida state going to the elite eight where they will face uh, a close one between alabama and texas i went with alabama texas has been hooping as of late though they had like that covid pause where they lost a few mm-hmm. games but since then they've been a uh, monsters now, I got Florida State going to the Final Four of beating Alabama. Okay. You know, Uh-oh. Leonard Hamilton, you know, he had them so close to the Final Four a couple years back, either two, three years ago. He's so um, underrated as a coach. Yeah, no, monster coach. Um, he's been doing a great – I mean, Florida State, yeah, they had Charlie Ward, but he was known more for football. But, like, they were a pretty dormant program for a while. And, and then Hamilton, he got there, what, about mid-2000s, I want to say? Yeah. 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 Yeah, so um, they've had some really players I've really enjoyed over the years, like O'Carro White and uh, Michael Snare, a guy that we were really close to getting at Stanford. At Mm -hmm. least that's what they tell me. Um, So then in the South, I got Baylor beating Winthrop. I got Winthrop going to the Sweet 16. Uh, I got Baylor in the Elite Eight taking on an Ohio State team that gets past Texas Tech who beats Colgate. I got Colgate getting to the round of 32 as a 14. Okay, so they beat Arkansas. They beat Arkansas. Um. So then, and then I got Baylor beating the Ohio State University to get to the final four out of the South. And then in the Midwest, I have Illinois beating uh, the Cade Cunningham's of Oklahoma State mm-hmm. and getting to the Elite Eight. And then I got Houston defeating San Diego State. And yeah. I got Illinois over Houston. So my final four is Gonzaga, Florida State, Baylor, Illinois. Not, I mean, I'm not exactly 
uh, reinventing the wheel here. Um, and I got Gonzaga over Florida State, Illinois over Baylor, and and uh, because I want to see Gonzaga play Illinois in the finals, so that's why I went with it. Okay. Um, and I got Gonzaga winning it all. I think I think we are going to have a perfect. It's just like even when they were tested by BYU, they ended up like winning that. I mean, the final score was pretty a, a pretty comfortable margin in the WCC finals. Like they were down most of that game, but like push came to shove. Jalen Suggs, Corey Kispert. Um, Let's go to work. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, they, they, they just got dudes for days. Yeah. Um, so, let's see. I'll start. I'll start in the West. Any big, crazy upsets? Um, I, 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 I went in between USC or Kansas. I, I couldn't decide. Okay. Because, it, it, like you said, there's the disappointment of the Pac-12 that gets you. But there's also a disappointment with Kansas, too. Like yes, they, 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 have their bad, they have their bad streak, too. Um, I ended up, I ended up going USC. Okay. Um, so yeah, I went USC, but then went Iowa and then Gonzaga beats Iowa to go to final four. Okay. Um, let's see in the East, you know, and yeah, I, I always don't, I usually don't like having three or more one seeds going to the final four. Uh, I think if Michigan didn't get this injury right before the tournament starts, I would have had them in the final four and probably winning it all potentially. But, you know, you have injuries like that to, to uh, you know, some key players. It's just so tough. Um, yeah. But I do have them getting to the Elite Eight uh, against Alabama. I actually have the winner of this game right now, UCLA, Michigan State, um, getting to the Elite Eight. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I got the Norfolk uh, State App State game on. Like, Norfolk State was up like 18 in the first half. They're trailing now. What's the two-point one. game now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, but then, yeah, Alabama – uh, I think it's just I, – I love what's going on with that program. Uh, Nate Oates seems like he's just absolutely crushing it. I saw uh, – I think someone was talking to John Calipari the other day about – or John Calipari. He texted John Calipari and and and, and uh, Coach Cal texted him back and said, just keep, just keep doing you because yeah. that, that's working. Um, so, you know, that's pretty big-time praise. Yeah. Um, let's see, in, in the South – uh, anything big here? I had Texas Tech going to the Sweet 16. I just love watching a uh, Mac McClung play. Oh, uh, so much yes. fun to watch. Uh, I, yeah. I wish he, he would have stayed at Georgetown. And obviously, I don't know the full situation there. Also, shout out Patrick Ewing, man. That, How about that? The, when, when, when the conference championship, shout, shout out to him. As an eight seed, uh, not getting recognized in Madison Square Garden. How? <laughs> <laughs> he's only like the most one of the most famous Knicks of all time seriously I, I, yeah I don't get that um but yeah Baylor goes to the final four um uh, and then in the midwest it'll end up being so in that side of the final four it'll end up being a big 12 matchup I actually have Kate Cunningham taking the Cowboys oh all I, the way I, I would um, love to see that I would I, and I think that's part of why I did it yeah <laughs> um and then let's see. Besides that, Oregon State gets out the first round, but then they lose to Oklahoma State. Now you got uh, more faith in them than I. <laughs> I, I, I. It's just one of those. Well you, well, you know what? We're here. They're who? Yeah, I mean they're playing well. Like I watched a lot of Oregon State last year because I had a game of theirs on Pac-12, and I watched mm-hmm. them a little bit this year. Like Wari Thalatiche, like that guy was made to dominate the G League. I feel like, and mm-hmm. like people are going to take that as a diss, but realize that when I say it. It's a huge compliment Absolutely. because uh, I, I love the G League and I really hope this guy plays in the G League, whether he's on a Simon or a two-way contract or something or, or on a true G League contract. Uh, it is not a diss to be playing in one of the top five leagues in the world. Uh, that guy is going to average a double-double with two blocks a game in the G League, ho- hopefully one day. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of his game. And Jared, Jared Lucas is just like one of the most confident shot makers in the Pac-12. Just uh, plays with that cockiness about him, in in a good sense. Like ah, oh mm-hmm. man, he's like he's like a mini JJ Redick. Mini JJ Redick, okay. Like just just from the sense of like he's got that like, um, you know, pardon my French, but there are some people who say he's he's got some shit to his game. Yeah, like, I got Jared you. Lucas I got you. Shit to his game. Okay. Um, so yeah. Okay. You know, I'm trying to think what else in this in this bracket. I th- and this was more so just to reward. The job he's done this year, I think, has been incredible. Um, John Passner, what he's done at Georgia Tech has been unreal. That turnaround that they've had already, uh, yeah. So that's why I gave them a round one win. Um, 
against the fighting uh was it sister jeans yeah yeah i i I had to give them just again just the but i mean like really when you look at georgia tech situation i mean they they're down i think a few scholarships um it's just it's just it's really tough if you look at the whole athletic scenario right now with georgia tech and so the fact that he has them you know they they won the conference tournament you know, you want to say, well, they didn't have to play Virginia. You know, they still won it. Like, they had to play some other teams it. to win it uh, yeah. that are in this field, too, might I add. So, congrats to him. And, I mean, I love seeing Tech be back in the tournament. I always think about 2004 when they made that run against uh, – all the way against UConn in the national championship. So, that's always fun to see for me. Yeah, the, the reason I didn't take Georgia Tech was because Moses Wright is out for the first game, the ACC right. player of the yeah. year. So that that's – but I will say um, they got uh, – their, their point guard, Jose Alvarado. Alvarado, oh, yeah. Man, I love why I watched him play a game last year because uh, Utah, the Utah Valley had a transfer from there, Evan Cole. Uh, mm-hmm. And I was supposed to do a Utah Valley Stanford game and it got canceled. But um, so I watched one of their games last year and uh, uh, Jose Alvarado jumped off the page to me or jumped off the screen. Uh, so big, big fan of his. And, and yeah, Josh Pastner, I mean, he was like this wonder kind coach coming up, like big time assistant in Arizona. Like people were thinking, all right, this is going to be the next big hot, like head coach. You know, he, he has like, a, a, it was kind of a flash of the pan at Memphis and like things were kind of going a little south at Georgia Tech. But I mean, the, like last year, they would have been in the NCAA tournament, I think. Um, this year, like obviously winning the ACC championship, like he's really got that thing going in the right direction now. And it's great to see. It is. And I mean, like you look at right down the street, basically, Georgia State for a while has kind of stolen the, the spotlight of basketball when it comes to college basketball in Atlanta. Um, after, you know, there was a whole Ron Hunter falling off the stool against Baylor in that upset. And they were always, yep. you know, they were always winning conference championships and, and getting into the tournament or at least threatening to get in the tournament. And so now here comes Georgia Tech going right back to where, you know, again, Atlanta is a, a big hotbed for college basketball recruits. So yep. the fact that that Tech is back in, man, it, it just it, I'm happy to see it. But unfortunately, it won't be that long this year, hey. in my opinion. <laughs> Shout out to Eric Revno, Georgia Tech assistant, former Stanford basketball yeah. player right. and former Kevin Dana boss, my freshman. Ah, year. okay. So, um, but then, yeah, so the Final Four, Baylor beats Oklahoma State. Uh, Gonzaga is going to be Alabama. I went back and forth on that one, um, but I'm going Gonzaga. And then national champion, I'm going Baylor. Okay. Uh, Baylor there wins 69-60. It's just something with me. It's something with me and, and Gonzaga, but I, I just can't. As good as they are, and, and you mentioned they've got they've got dudes, but yeah, it's just always it always comes back to that schedule for me. And when the lights shine brightest, and you have to go against this tough competition weekend after a weekend eventually in my opinion it, it catches up to you and and so I think you know obviously if you make it to the national championship you know it's a great season but I think that's where it gets them okay yeah I mean you know to to your point like outside of the one final four run like they've had like a lot of blunders as yep. top seeds like they almost became the first one seed to lose to a 16 like southern took them to overtime mm-hmm. that's right um They've had, you know, they've had their turn, you know, going out in the round of 32 as a, as a one or two seed. Um, I just think like this year they played some top tier teams. Like they blew Kansas out of the water. Mm-hmm. They, I, I think they blew Iowa out of the water. I'm, I'm pulling up their schedule just really quick because like their like their first few games this year were just like my word. Yeah, like, they beat, they beat Auburn by 23. They beat Kansas by 12. They beat West Virginia by 5. They beat Iowa by 11. Um, they beat Virginia by 23. And then uh, then they got into their conference schedule. So, like, they had a lot of impressive wins uh, before they got to the WCC, which, you know, they, they usually have, like, two or three really solid teams. BYU, St. Mary's is usually Mary's, pretty good. Yeah. So like those those three are, are solid and San Francisco's had some uh, ha, has had some up in like San Francisco I want they beat what Virginia this year I want to say that's right they did so it, Golden's doing his thing there as well but yeah so um, whatever my point was 
<laughs> and no, I mean, like, I've made it. I mean, it is a good one, though. I mean, like you said, they have some big wins. But again, once you get into conference play, you don't. Again, we talk about the WCC. It's a solid conference, but it's not the same level of competition as you got yeah. with like the Iowa and then the Virginia. And then, I mean, they had a win against Auburn, but I don't think Sharif Cooper was playing yet for for Auburn at that All time. Right, Touche. Fair enough. Whereas yeah. you know you have Baylor, you know, against Oklahoma State. Texas Tech, Kansas, yep. Texas, like all these yep. teams, plus Virginia. Um, so that, and that's, that's the thing for me where it's like, I think eventually it just gets you. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, that, 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 that's definitely a fair point because, you know, to this point, they haven't climbed the mountaintop yet and they've only had, I mean, only had one final four to show for it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, I understand. Yeah. So those are our final four picks. Interesting to see what yours are. I wonder if I'll make my, – my bracket will make it past the first day. Usually it doesn't, but we'll yeah. see. Um, and, yeah, thanks again, everyone, for tuning in this week. Hopefully we'll have another one for you next week. Everyone, as always, stay safe, wear your mask, stay inside if possible. Have a good one, and we will see you soon. Peace.